And this is BBC Two bringing you a revolution in entertainment and some of the world's most powerful moments now. All from a bit of lateral thinking, a couple of knitting needles, a hat box and Jeremy Clarkson. Tonight's invention was developed by a man who'd already given us the thermal undersock and marmalade from the Caribbean, and yet he would die a broken man. It was exploited by the Nazis, and yet it would help Britain win the war. It brought women out of the kitchen, it made us fat, and without it, I simply wouldn't have a job. So, three cheers then for the television. We humans are bright, restless and endlessly curious, which is fine. But being clever means that we get bored easily. A dog, for instance, is perfectly happy to spend all day sniffing bottoms, whereas I've usually had enough after one or two. Maybe that's why, then, we devote so much time and energy to thinking up new and exciting ways of amusing ourselves. <laughs> Before television, entertainment was, how can I put this, a little patchy. Having said that, though, a good hanging would get the sort of audience BBC Four can only dream about. For news, people mainly relied on word of mouth and idle gossip at the pub, a bit like EastEnders. And people would go to the theatre for unadulterated melodrama that preferably ended in a fight. A bit like Soldier Soldier. But then along came TV and everything changed. It rearranged our living rooms, it introduced us to the concept of someone being famous for being famous, and we got this, a programme called The UK's Worst Toilet. Five million of you watched it. That's one in 12 people in Britain thought, no, we won't go to the theatre. We won't go and take the dog for a walk. We'll stay in and watch a programme about lavatories. Oh, there's one, look, there's one. Mm. The television you're watching right now is not simply an entertainment machine. It has incredible powers. It has won wars, but it can make disaster out of a crisis. It has liberated the oppressed, but caused societies to disintegrate. In Europe, we have more TV sets than children and spend nine years of our lives watching them. The small screen dominates our existence. And that's remarkable for a device that was brought to us by the Scottish inventor of the pneumatic boot and a 14-year-old Mormon from Utah. But before them, it was Italian Guglielmo Marconi who started the ball rolling. Marconi decided it might be possible to send messages across great distances without wires. Spurred on by the prospect of serious money, he started work until, in 1895, the breakthrough came. A gunshot confirmed the successful transmission and the world of wireless telecommunications was born. Marconi's invention was an instant success in shipping, not least when an SOS from the Titanic saved the lives of 703 people. National Broadcasting Company presents a special bulletin... And it didn't stop there. Once it was discovered how to transmit actual speech, the wireless era began in earnest. Radio was a revolution in entertainment, bringing the pub and the theatre and the hangings into your living room. Scientists and the popular press began to speculate about what the next step might be. They figured that if radio waves could go through the air and into people's houses, then why not pictures? They even began to think about what such a thing might be called. 
radioscope, radio vision, teleramophone, telephonoscope. It was actually a Russian who came up with the idea of combining the Greek word for long way away with the Latin word for to see. And there we are, television. Now all someone had to do is make one. At least 52 people contributed parts and ideas to the television. All over the world, people were developing bits without knowing how they could be used. A Scotsman called Campbell Swinton actually drew a complete design for an electronic TV, but he didn't think it could be done and chucked it in the bin. Then there was the German, Paul Nitkoff, who one Christmas Eve designed a disc that could scan images, as you do if you have no friends. But it was Nitkoff's spinning disc that inspired the work of an eccentric Brit, an ideas man ahead of his time, John Logie Baird. Like most inventors, actually, John Logie Baird was Scottish. But he was a poorly man, constantly in ill health. So he moved to the seaside town of Hastings, here on the south coast. Baird wrote in his diary, coughing, choking and spluttering and so thin as to be almost transparent. I arrived at Hastings Station, assets totalling £200, prospects, nothing. Baird suffered from two things, hypothyroidism, which made him weak, and an enormous capacity for rubbish inventions, which made him poor. He hoped the seaside air would revitalise his body and provide some inspiration. He needed some. In his 20s, he tried to create diamonds by heating graphite. To get enough power, he tapped into the mains and blew up Glasgow's entire power supply. Another bright idea was to design a glass razor. It was completely rust resistant, which was good, but there were downsides. Next, inspired by pneumatic tires, he had a go at pneumatic shoes. Baird's prototype contained semi-inflated balloons, which burst. Baird then came up with a thermal undersock, and remarkably this was a modest success. But Baird, by this time, was ill, and his doctor advised a change of climate. <coughs> Leaving Glasgow and his girlfriend behind, he headed for Trinidad, where he spent his sock money on marmalade. His plan was to bottle it, export it, make his fortune and marry his girl. But by the time it reached England, his nest egg was full of maggots and had to be destroyed. And to garnish his misfortune with even more misery, his one true love went off and married someone with a proper job. Desperate, ill and virtually penniless, Baird came for a walk along this very coastal path just outside Hastings and he thought, I've got to invent something, don't care what it is, lava lamp, sandwich maker, rotating washing line, anything. After a while, he thought, wouldn't it be good if instead of just hearing the person on the radio, you could see them as well? And that, that fascinates me, because it's like me walking along and thinking, wouldn't it be good to invent a time machine? Yes, it would. I could go back and win loads of money on the horses, but I have no idea what I might need. A bed, on the other hand, being this mad kind of inspirational tinkerer, scuttled back into town and went shopping. Baird had no money, no lab facilities, no specialist expertise and no experience of electrical engineering. But that didn't stop him. 
in 1923 at 21 Linton Crescent in Hastings, he started work. When you see what he collected, it gives you an insight into the magnificently lateral mind of the inventor. To make television, he got himself the lamp from the front of a bicycle, a pair of scissors, a hat box, obviously. Uh, then there's the tea chest in which we find a selection of cotton bobbins and some sealing wax. Then over here, we have the glue and the knitting needles. And then, when he'd got himself the lid from a coffin, he was ready to start work. He used the coffin lid as a base. He then took the lid off the hat box, pierced holes through it in a spiral pattern, used a knitting needle as a shaft, and turned it into a scanning disc. This converted the object in front of it into a series of lines. The lines of light were then converted into an electrical signal, which could then be transmitted to a light bulb, which shone through a reverse scanning disk, which reconstructed the original picture. Understand that? No, well, nor do I. But it worked. In 1923, Baird managed to transmit the image of a cross. Not exactly the UK's worst toilet, but we're on our way. And Baird was delighted. Unfortunately, however, he wasn't the only one working on the big idea. Over in America, there was a Mormon boy from Idaho called Philo T. Farnsworth. Farnsworth was born in Utah, but in 1918, when young Philo was 11, the family moved here to Rigby, Idaho, which, like Hastings, is proud to call itself the birthplace of television. The family really couldn't afford any books, so he did not have a lot of education. But when they arrived at the ranch in Rigby that had this Delco power plant, he found in the attic of the bungalow ranch a treasure trove of scientific journals and magazines. And it's here that he probably really began to learn about television for the first time. He was probably sitting up one night, flipping through an issue of, of Science and Invention magazine when he came across a story about pictures that could fly through the air. And this was a story that really captivated his imagination. I was trying to find out who is this. Anyone we know? <laughs> <laughs> the two of us, it's the blind leading the blind here. Now in their 90s, Farnsworth's younger sisters have fond memories of their older brother. His mind was an inquiring mind, and he wanted to know what made the world go round. And that's why he, he became an inventor, because he wanted to see what motivated, what made things move. And so that's, that's the kind of a person he was. He, he would say things, and we just took his word for everything, didn't we, Laura? Everything he said was right, was correct. Because he said so. Because Philo said so. In 1921, two years before John Logie Baird had his moment of inspiration on the clifftop near Hastings, Thornsworth had a similar epiphany while working in a field. As he looked at the furrows he had just ploughed, he thought, hang on, you could scan an image with electrons if they were in rows like that. Genius. And he was only 14 years old. Farnsworth quickly fleshed out the details and back at school covered his classroom blackboard with his diagrams and equations.
And the teacher comes into the room at the end of the day and sees this wild array of diagrams and formulas that he's written on the board. And he says, what does this have to do with chemistry? And Philo puts down his chalk and says, this is my idea for electronic television. And the teacher says, television? What's that? What the boy genius drew was the first electronic camera tube completely electronic television. There were no spinning discs, no coffin lids, no knitting needles. But of the two systems, only one could survive. And since Baird had actually produced and transmitted an image, he was ahead. Things were looking good for the father of the thermal sock. The cross was the breakthrough Baird needed. It proved his system worked. His father was sufficiently impressed to fund him to the tune of 50 quid. But Baird needed more than just money and set about attracting some outside interest in his invention. So he advertised in the Times. Seeing by wireless, inventor of apparatus wishes to hear from someone who will assist, not financially, in making a working model. He was lucky. His ad was noticed by Cinema Supremo Will Day, and with Day's sponsorship, Baird thought up ways to improve his machine. What he decided is that his new machine needed more power. A lot more. 2,000 volts, in fact. So he went out and bought himself hundreds and hundreds of batteries. Now, bearing in mind his last experiment with electricity had blotted out the Glasgow power supply, this was likely to end in tears. And it did. <coughs> Baird's landlord wasn't at all impressed by the electrocution and quickly evicted the singed Scot. He had no money and things looked bleak. But luckily, his sponsors stuck with him and found him a little attic flat here at 22 Frith Street in the middle of London, Soho. Hi. Double espresso, please. Today, the building's a cafe, which means it survived Baird's tenure. But only just. Although Baird had managed to get an image to appear on his rudimentary television, there were still problems to overcome. The mechanical Nipkoff disc that scanned the image had to be made bigger to get a brighter, clearer picture. So, in his attic, Baird set about the task of making monstrous plywood discs with enormous 8-inch lenses. And at first, it looked like he was on to a winner. Not one to give up, Baird had the bright idea of studying the best lens he could find, the human eye. He fooled the surgeon into thinking he was a fellow doctor and took home a freshly removed eye. Unfortunately, while Baird may have been a fine inventor, he was a hopeless surgeon. And the eye just went squish. Fortunately for the Scot, on the other side of the Atlantic, the young American lad, Farnsworth, hadn't got very far developing his idea either. He was the eldest in the family, and when his father died in 1924, he had to give up his education, put his television dream on hold, and find work to support the rest of the family. While Farnsworth faltered, Baird was preparing to trial the latest version of his television. But first he needed some dummy to sit in front of his camera. Now this is a Stooky Bill. Uh, it's actually a ventriloquist dummy's head that Baird um, purchased off a market stall to replace a human sitting in front of it because his original camera was so insensitive that he poured more and more light onto the object he was televising 
until he got to the point where he, on one occasion, set fire to someone's hair. So here we have Stooky Bill sitting in front of a spinning disc. In October 1925, with a final flurry of twisting knobs and crossing fingers, Baird at last managed to get an image of the dummy's face on his television. It was in shades of grey rather than just black and white, and this was a major step forward. But it wasn't enough for Baird. He was determined to see a human face on the screen. So he grabbed the first person he could find, and that person turned out to be a teenager called Bill Tainton. Stay here and look straight ahead, OK? I was a bit scared of doing it, but he assured me that everything was all right and nothing to worry about. And then um, he disappeared to, uh, into the, to go down the receiving end to, to see if we can see a picture or something or other. And um, I got into focus and couldn't stop there much more in a minute because of the terrific heat from these lamps. And uh, I pulled away. You've moved a wee bit. You're out of focus. You've got to keep very, very still. With that, he put his hand in his pocket and pressed half a crown in my hand. So, so that was the first television fee, half a crown? That, uh, you can say, was the first television fee in the world. You should have got a better agent. So uh, I was pleased with half a crown. Actually, I did all what Mr Baird asked me to do. Uh, when, he, when he got back to the receiver, he shouted out, Can you just stick your tongue out for me, please? Couldn't make out what he's really up to. So I poked my tongue out, and I thought it was rude at the time, mind you. It's worked. I can see him. This is a photograph of what he would have seen, the first ever television transmission of a human face. Well, he was still excited when he spoke to me, and he said, what do you think of it, William? So I came out point blank and said, I don't think much of it. Whatever Baird's living dummy might have thought of the weird Scots mesmerizing apparatus, the man himself was ecstatic. I can see you! Television at last! Keen to show off his amazing invention as quickly as possible, Baird invited selected members of the Royal Institution round to his flat. And so on, January the 26th, 1926, the great and the good, dressed in full evening dress, trudged up this dingy staircase to see what all the fuss was about. <clears throat> Gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed for coming along to my demonstration of television. <laughs> <laughs> Baird was worried. Not that they wouldn't be impressed, but that the lenses on the Nipkoff disc might shake loose again, massacring his guests. All that happened, though, was that one man got his beard caught. <laughs> The audience managed to see the face of a person. Although faint and blurred, it was transmitted from one room to the other. Some thought this was trickery. During his demonstration, Baird caught one suspicious man crawling under the apparatus to find out how it was done. Uh, excuse me, sir, have you, uh, have you lost something down here? Television had arrived. Baird was on a high. Instead of closeting himself away at lunchtime with a scone and a cup of Presbyterian tea, he was to be found charging around Soho, gorging himself on peach and peacock. This to him would have been an hors d'oeuvre, an amuse-bouche. There were fine wines washed down with lashings of hot brandy. He was, without realising it, the original media lovey. Ironically, his favourite restaurant was the Ivy, which today is the favourite haunt of all the stars that his invention created. But over in the United States, the young pretender was closing in. While Baird gorged his way through London's West End, an altogether more sober Farnsworth had settled down in San Francisco. The Utah farm boy, now aged 20, had set up a laboratory and was once more working obsessively on his television system. Though he had married, he remained faithful to his electronic mistress and confessed to his wife 
I think you should know there's another woman in my life, and her name is Television. But his intellectual infidelity paid off. In less than a year, Farnsworth had a device that actually displayed an image. All of a sudden, Baird's mechanical system had an electronic rival. Farnsworth got his first picture on this cathode ray tube. It was a simple image of a straight line that appeared in a field no bigger than a postage stamp on the face of this cathode ray tube on September 7th, 1927. And that was the breakthrough that he had been waiting for. Back in Britain, Baird was under pressure. He was forced to combine gluttony with designing, using tablecloths in the restaurants he visited to work on improvements. He must have looked like a paranoid fool as he scuttled around with a sheaf of tablecloths under his arm. John Logie Baird, however, was keen to convince the Americans that he wasn't out of the picture. And so, just two years after his first clumsy demonstration of television, he scored another first. He broadcast live pictures of a woman in London across 3,000 miles of ocean to a television set in New York. In February 1928, Baird still ruled the TV roost, but his reign was short-lived. A few months later, Farnsworth launched his cathode ray tube system in San Francisco and the press went wild. It was anyone's race, but neither of them won. Big business saw just how enormous television might be. In America, the giant RCA Corporation developed their very own completely original electronic system leaving Farnsworth out in the cold. And in the UK, Marconi EMI were developing a similar electronic system leaving Baird out of the equation. However, here, Baird had an indulgent auntie. Baird persuaded the BBC to let him use their radio transmitters for his experimental broadcasts. His television then was no longer theory, he was actually transmitting. It is now 12 years ago since I produced the first little flickering television image. Today we have in London a regular television service, twice daily, with thousands of lookers in. Baird became the first in the world to broadcast live television pictures, and he marketed his Baird television like a true businessman. This is the only surviving example of the world's first mass-produced television set. It was made in 1927. It's a Baird Model B televisor. Um, they were very, very expensive, about the same price as buying a brand new Rolls-Royce car. In fact, they were so expensive that the Baird company rapidly had to rethink and bring out a much cheaper model. It's almost like a pair of video headphones. You actually watch it like this. Early broadcasts were, quite frankly, rubbish because the sound and the picture weren't in sync. So what you actually got was something like this. I would talk to you for two minutes. And then the screen would go black and then you'd hear what I just said. Didn't matter though. People were amazed. Ah. So you've missed your train? Yes. I got to the station and there it was, just pulling out. The first play ever broadcast was The Man with a Flower in His Mouth. There were three characters. All you could see was their head and shoulders and then they would slide in and out of a fixed studio chair when the checkered board came across. And you had to look really, really hard to see the picture. A dozen, more or less. I'd have caught it. Well, the uh, early 30 line television pictures from about 1929 onwards were very small, only about half the size of a postcard. They were dim, and because you weren't using a neon lamp, they weren't black and white, they were orange and black. Like most people, Ray Herbert, who was 12 at the time, couldn't afford to buy a bad televisor. So he bought a kit of parts and built one for himself and his parents. And you had to crouch down as the person operating the system so that you could just see the bottom bit of the picture, 
making the adjustments as necessary, enabling your parents to look over your shoulder and, and see the, the picture itself. Well, it was a great occasion when I got my first picture in, in November and I summoned my father in <clears throat> who thought I should be in bed at 11 o'clock instead of fiddling about with, um, with television equipment. And I said to him, um, there you are, that's television. And he said, oh, you sure? You sure it's not a pattern of the wallpaper? And I said, no, no, it's a television picture. While the BBC were busying themselves broadcasting plays about men with foliage in their mouths, there was another broadcaster with a much clearer agenda. Hey, the Nazis were quick to realise the potential of television and became the world's first public service broadcaster. And to make sure everyone got the message, Nazi TV helpfully installed the hugely expensive set in community centres. With the uplifting material, it was like daytime television now, only with Kilroy replaced by Hitler. The Nazis were the first, but by no means the last, to try and use the television as a tool to manipulate the masses. Back in Blighty, where there were masses just longing to be manipulated, the BBC finally decided it was time to get serious. The trouble was there were two systems, Baird's and Marconi's, and that is the way with the Beeb. They went for both. Here at Alexandra Palace in London, they built two studios. To my right, one for the bantamweight Baird with his mechanical system, and to my left, one for the heavyweight corporation, Marconi EMI, with its Farnsworth-style electronic system. And they took it in turns to broadcast one week Baird, one week Marconi EMI. And then, after six months, whoever offered the best service would win the airwaves of Britain. So, on November the 2nd, 1936, BBC television was born. They even wrote a special song to celebrate the new arrival. Conjured up in sound and sight by the magic rays of light. Now, with such gems as the UK's worst toilets, you could be forgiven for thinking that modern TV has gone down the pan. But trust me on this, it hasn't. It used to be much, much worse. Yes, I'm quite well, thank you. The 1930s was not TV's golden era. I have not come here to be made a laughing stock. No, no, please, please. This is a carving by the young English sculptor Henry Moore. I imagine that you could find your way alone in the dark. Yes, I can. But even if tap dancing and people in feathers were your bag and you decided to buy a TV, it wasn't easy. So the poor old viewer went into a big department store like Selfridges and said, I want to buy a television set. And the sales assistant would say, certainly, do you want an EMI system or do you want to buy a Baird system? And if you made the wrong choice, six months down the line, you were left with a worthless piece of junk. Nonetheless, the competition was underway, with an early lead for Marconi EMI, whose picture quality was generally considered superior. And then, disaster. As Baird struggled to match Marconi's quality, his labs in the Crystal Palace were burnt down. The derelict shambles resembles nothing on Earth, least of all the old Crystal Palace. Baird's TV system and his dreams went up in smoke. The fire was the end for Baird. And the BBC never even bothered waiting for the end of the competition. They simply handed the airwaves to Marconi EMI. Baird was devastated. As, of course, were all the people who'd wasted such a vast amount of money buying one of his television sets. Now, cameras, please, here are the instructions. We're using all three of you in this scene. But people who'd bought the Marconi EMI system didn't fare well either. Because no sooner had the BBC started to develop their new thing, it was brought to a grinding halt by the start of the Second World War. Afraid that enemy bombers might use the TV signal to guide them, the BBC stopped transmitting. For five years, there truly was nothing to watch on television. 
August 8th, 1940, and the battle for Britain is on. 30 enemy aircraft over the channel, flying due west. However, little did the Luftwaffe know that they would soon be defeated by television. Picture the scene. It's 1940, and pretty well every day, wave after wave of German bombers are flying over this very stretch of Sussex coastline. Now, we were outnumbered and outgunned. We should have lost, but we had one critical advantage. Thanks to the new invention of radar, we could see them coming. Radar wouldn't have been possible without one vital ingredient taken directly from television, the cathode ray tube. Suddenly, scientists didn't need to listen to confusing radar signals. They had a screen on which they could actually see the incoming aircraft. Here comes the Luftwaffe. In dozens of flights, hundreds of planes, In the Battle of Britain, it armed our forces with the exact position and distance of the enemy and helped win the most decisive air battle of the war. If it wasn't for radar, this program would probably be in German. So, in 1940, television didn't change the world. It did something much more important. It stopped the world being changed. Hello, everybody. This is the BBC television station at Alexandra Palace. When the war was over, which incidentally we won, television really took off, and 20,000 sets were sold in the UK in the first year. The sets were cheaper and better, and the rebirth of programming was perfectly timed. Mix on your camera one. It brought some light relief to the doom and gloom of post-war depression. But while television was back and booming, the same couldn't be said of its inventors. John Logie Baird died a broken man. For 23 years, he'd nursed his invention, bringing the world the first television pictures, the first TV presenter, even the first transatlantic broadcast. But Baird's system was fatally flawed. Mechanical TV was never going to change the world. In America, Farnsworth watched helpless as the mega-corporation RCA claimed his invention as their own, broadcasting to the masses and getting all the glory. Deeply embittered, he gave up on television and turned his brilliant mind to nuclear fusion. Until drinking got the better of him. He didn't know when to stop. An overactive mind that never slept. He'd have some, at night sometimes, he'd have to have something to put him to sleep. He started taking a glass of wine, and then he'd have one or two glasses later on. It's not a thing that we especially are proud of to say, but the thing that took him in the end was alcohol. It was a sad ending for the American genius who took his inspiration from the land and invented what you and I call television. You know, I've worked in television for 15 years, but I still have no idea how the actual set works. I recognize that these are speakers and that they have an important job to do. And I presume all this has something to do with electricity. But how that electricity gets down this bit, which is the cathode ray tube, and then makes a picture on the screen, I'm completely clueless. It's more unfathomable than an internal combustion engine. And to think it was all dreamed up by a 14-year-old boy.
Farnsworth died sad and disillusioned. He was buried in this graveyard in Provo, Utah. But his spirit lives on, and these bikers from Salt Lake City who all work in television are named after the man who invented it. They're called Philo's Angels. We're very interested in Philo T. Farnsworth because he's, as the inventor of TV, he created a business and whole industry that we're all involved in. We all love it. We have a great time working on it. It's fantastic. And if it wasn't for Philo T. Farnsworth, I'd probably still be a bartender. Television changed the world for most people because they got to see things they never would have seen before, like London, England, Paris, France, countries like Italy and many different inventions that we would have never heard about for years. Rest in peace. I think without question, Philo deserves the inventor's title for television. Here's an Idaho farm boy, you know, who put things together in his head and on a chalkboard with no real laboratory or formal training. And he did it months, if not years ahead of what everybody else did. Yeah, he deserves it, I think. Thank you, Philo. Appreciate you. By the time Philo T. Farnsworth died, television was well on its way to becoming the most powerful tool of mass communication on the planet. Television was changing history. For joint appearances, the subject matter... The most famous example of this was a televised debate in 1960 between would-be presidential candidates Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. Nixon looked tired and haggard. Make a better shave. While Kennedy looked like a young, vibrant Cary Grant. This is a great country, but I think it could be a greater country. People listening to this the debate on the radio country, were convinced Nixon be was the better part. man, but on TV, it was Kennedy who won, and it was TV that mattered. So if television had never been invented, Nixon may very well have won that election. And if he'd won it, he'd have been in the hot seat during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Once again then, television stopped the world being changed. If Nixon had started a nuclear war over Cuba, then I'm sure it would have been the most exciting television programme of all time. And possibly the shortest. The power of television images speak for themselves. A picture really is worth a thousand words. Imagine if the moon landing had never been televised. No one would ever have believed that Armstrong had taken that giant leap for mankind. Great shadow. Contact light. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I'm standing on top of the Berlin Wall, which for years has been the most potent symbol of the division of Europe. And there can be few better illustrations of the changes which are sweeping across this continent than the party which is taking place here on top of it tonight. And television doesn't just record events, it can change them. If it weren't for television, the Berlin Wall may never have fallen. That collapse of the Berlin Wall came about because people in East Berlin could watch West German television. It was in their language, it was all about them, and although they were never allowed to go there, they could see what life was like on the other side of the wall, and they wanted to be part of it. And it created an enormous strength of feeling on the part of East Germans that they shouldn't be treated differently. They shouldn't live one life, while people are exactly the same, a few hundred yards away, lived another life. And television created the pressure, it showed them when to move, and it showed them what had happened. And it, it really was a, a, a moment in which television impacted on every part of the process. Television has had some really powerful moments, but I, I don't think anything matches the impact of what happened and what was seen and broadcast from New York City 
on September the 11th when the, the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center were destroyed and seen being destroyed on live TV by tens, hundreds of millions, as far as I know, of people around the world. Imagine if the World Trade Center collapse hadn't been televised. Would its impact have been so big? The fact that it was broadcast, the fact that so many people saw it, I think magnified uh, its power many times. And, well, just look at the world around us now and we can see the consequences of September the 11th. A huge catastrophic event like that would of course had impact had it not been on TV, but I, I wonder whether or not the attack would even have been launched without the knowledge that it would have been broadcast around the world on television. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people... And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. There's certainly an argument that big news events are where television has had its biggest impact. But I'm not so sure, because there's another form of television which is more pervasive than advertising, more persuasive than a party political broadcast, and far more popular than any news programme. I'm talking, of course, about the soap opera. It's now the most popular form of TV worldwide. In India, for example, 125 million people a week tune in to watch the soap detective VJ. Tino jage meri ek ek saheli hai. Main tino se bahut pyar karta hu. Meri samajh mein nahi aata main kisse shaadi karu. Aaiye. Aaiye beti. Aapko pata hai na ki ek se zyada logon ke sath sharirik sambandh rakhna khatarnak ho sakta hai. आप एचआईवी विषाणु लगने की बात तो नहीं कर रहे आई एम इम्प्रेस्ड एंड वी ऑफ कोर्स हैव द सेम सोर्ट ऑफ थिंग इन ब्रिटेन एज वेल इन द लास्ट फ्यू इयर्स ईस्ट एंड इज अलोन हैज कवर्ड अडॉप्शन अबोर्शन अल्कोहलिज्म अल्जाइमर्स बिगमी ब्रेस्ट कैंसर कॉट डेथ डिप्रेशन डिवोर्स डोमेस्टिक वायलेंस ड्रग्स ईटिंग डिसऑर्डर्स फॉस्टरिंग हार्ट डिजीज हेपेटाइटिस एचआईवी होमोसेक्सुअलिटी इलिटरेसी इमिग्रेशन मेनिनजाइटिस miscarriage pancreatitis prostitution racism rape schizophrenia sexual harassment single parents stalking suicide truancy and underage drinking doesn't anyone just go for a walk in the park and have a nice time i mean small wonder we're all so depressed now i've never watched a single episode of eastenders not because it's all so miserable but because i once caught dallas I therefore know soap is addictive and influential. Trevor, what are you doing here? I've come to take you home. No. Take a recent storyline from Albert Square. Apparently, this man, who's called Trevor, I'm gonna do this to me, you bitch. had been beating up this woman, who's called Mo, until one day... <laughs> what we weren't prepared for, even then, was the volume of the calls that came in and the letters that followed them, not just to us, also to the actors concerned. <laughs> a guy came up to me in a bar. He was a carpet fitter and he'd gone round to someone's house and there was a picture of my, my EastEnders publicity photograph was on this wall of this woman's house. And he said, oh, do, you know, do you know her? And this woman said, no, but she saved my life. And he said, well, how? And he said, because of the... I watched EastEnders and I realised it was me and I realised it had been me for 20 years and I thought I'd do something about it and I phoned the number and I got out. I don't think in a way that we can take the credit for that, for being wonderful campaigners. I think it's simply a testament to the power of television. 
There is no doubt that television is influential, but I've always been deeply skeptical that it's to blame for all the ills in society. I've always felt that TV reflects modern life rather than the other way round. I mean, the other night I watched The Terminator on Channel 5 and I didn't feel the need to go out afterwards and steal someone's clothes and motorcycle. But then this argument was shaken somewhat by something that happened in Bhutan. The ancient Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan was built as an isolated retreat where monks could practice their Buddhist faith and where a night out meant a round of archery and a good knees up. It was a real Shangri-La of peace and harmony. That is until 1998, when the king finally gave in and introduced cable television in 47 channel Technicolor. Its impact was immediate. You couldn't have set up a better scientific experiment to show how television affects society if you tried. Suddenly, the Bhutanese became faster consumers than the Beckhams. Farmers who previously, their only thought was which go, which ceremonial robe they were going to wear in winter or in summer, the light one or the heavy one. They wanted a certain kind of oil for their tractor. Their wife, they wanted a certain kind of soap. And skin whitening products that now become tremendously uh, aggressively marketed and that young girls are now asking, demanding their parents for. And it was found in some of the outlying towns that there were girls who were the first time prostituting themselves to raise money to buy the most basic things they were seeing on TV. And it doesn't stop there. Traditional activities have been replaced by goggling at the box. 35% of parents prefer to watch TV than to talk to their children. 50% of children watch more than 12 hours of TV every day. And worryingly, some might say predictably, violent crime is on the increase. There have been one or two pretty hideous murders that have taken place with great violence and a few crimes that have been motivated by um, heroin, which um, people have begun to smoke. And certainly this was a fairly drug-free society, apart from probably the odd crafty grass joint that was passed around by farmers. But despite the adverse effects, does the government regret introducing television? Television is really a means to knowledge. And knowledge is empowerment. And empowerment is what this country wants to provide to its people. Enlightenment, however, is not the only thing that TV can bring to the people. There's also obesity. Yep, it's official. TV makes you fat. The land of the brave and the home of the vast is, of course, an ideal place to conduct research into this kind of thing. And a man in Memphis, one time home to the fattest man in pop, has been doing just that, running a series of tests investigating the physical effects of television on children. Okay, Josh, I had to get on the bed here. I'm going to put this helmet on you. His young subjects watched the box and were then made to watch nothing at all. Put the wall for me, all right? And what we found, surprisingly, was when children watch television, their metabolic rate, the number of calories they burn, was actually lower than if they were doing nothing at all, which makes them actually at risk for obesity. What we think is that they're not fidgeting. Children fidget all the time. Just ask any parent. It seems that children, when they're watching television, don't do that fidgeting. On average, children in our country watch more television per day than the number of hours they're in school. When adults are watching five to eight hours a day and children are watching six to nine hours a day, it's too much. There's very good data that shows that as the number of hours of television rise that you watch, your obesity increases. The worry is, of course, that today there's so much telly on offer, we can only get bigger. With the advent of cable and satellite television, there are now, in Britain alone, 899 different channels. And that's too much choice. You have to go 
past the Norwegian weather, past the God Channel, past the duchy on the left-hand side. It's like wading through an oyster. There's yard after yard of phlegm. But it is worth it, because occasionally you find the pearl. No, no, this is it! I'm going to give you a damn good trashy! I'm sorry. It's you, a quite straight yes or no. question, and I would give you an answer. Did you, answer. you threaten to overrule him? <laughs> With respect, that is not answering the question of whether you threatened to overrule him. Or could not Did do, you threaten to I overrule him, Mr stupid. Howard? I've got nice legs in there. But with respect, you haven't answered the question of whether you threatened to overrule him. No, hold, hold, hold. No, no. Hold. We'll, leave, we'll leave that aspect there. But now, because of the speed of technological change, television as we know it is on the way out. Pretty soon, this is going to become obsolete. The television set is going to merge with the computer screen so that you'll be able to watch programmes and graze the internet and play games all at the same time. And what's more, you'll be able to access a bank of every single programme that's ever been made. So, your video recorder will be obsolete too. In fact, it already is, because we've already got televisions that remember to record your favourite programmes and then play them back to you whenever you want, without the adverts, which I should imagine will have a fairly dramatic effect on the advertising industry. And, um... Don't worry about finding the time to watch all this stuff, because obviously you'll have a television in your car. Look, there you go. And it's me, of all people. And because screens will become so small, we've already got them down to this size, you'll be able to have one in your sunglasses. Look at that. There's actually a screen there, so you'll be able to watch Kilroy on the beach. Wonder how he got so brown. And one in your telephone. It is remarkable that something which started out in life as a couple of knitting needles and a coffin has in just 80 years done its bit to avoid a nuclear holocaust, win a war and bring relief to millions of starving Africans. And it hasn't finished yet, because when three-dimensional holographic television gets here, people will be able to come out of the box and move among you. So you'll be able to have me actually in your own living room. Think about that. Good, Good night. night.